Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Corchero, hard to pronounce for a non-Spanish speaker. And uh, I work at Bloomberg. I'm here today to speak about uh, testing doubles and the different kinds that we have and how to work with them in Python. So first of all, the clicker doesn't work. So first of all, uh, so what are testing doubles? So testing doubles is just an object that looks like, uh, like the original one, but where the creator is in control of, uh, of its behavior. So as, as in the movies, uh, you probably want your baby to be there. So you just put a, a testing double that you have control over um, for, just for the, for the system and the test that you are testing. And you might be wondering, why do we need testing doubles? So you just leave uni, you go, to, uh, you go to a company, and they tell you, like, hey, you just need to, you need to test out uh, this function, which is it's like, it's a really important function. We have no test. We want you to write some tests for it and see if there's any bug. And this is going to predict the department expenses. So you say, like, OK, you know, I've started this thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try some values, you know, edge cases, blah, blah, blah. Then you say, like, oh, whatever, I'm going to drop an array of numbers. I'm going to test a lot of things with different badges. Then your phone rings. And they tell you, hey, Mario, uh, the whole management board is receiving emails about uh, the department expenses for next year. Can you please stop doing whatever you do? So testing doubles are here to help you isolate the system under test that you're testing. They are great to simulate the scenarios. Let's say that, for example, you want to try, you want to try out what happens if when sending an email, which this function was doing and we did not uh, notice, what happens if when sending an email something fails. And it's also good to be able to uh, scope your tests. So the first of all is, how do you create them in, uh, in Python? So because we just said that testing doubles are just uh, objects that can be used to replace other objects, which you can just create, for example, here, this is Mario double. My name is Mario. So you can just create this object that could behave as a real Mario. Uh, but in Python, we are lucky that we have the, um, the mock library within the mock module within unit test. And but just using, for example, the mock, uh, mock class, you can create this kind of object much easily, as we'll see in the, in the, in the following slides. So, uh, but this, we, this whole talk is around testing double, and, uh, uh, and sometimes you might not need mock at all. For example, in some situations, you might have, uh, you might have a class, well, you might have a function that you want to, to test, and you might, have an, you might have arguments that you just want to fail. In those situations, a good testing double can just be a simply none or a string. This is known, so there's a lot of naming conventions around uh, testing and testing doubles and the kind of testing double. If you're interested, I'm going to put a lot of links at the end. For those of you quite familiar with testing, I'm going to put how this is referred by Mesos and other um, philosophers of testing that you can find out in the wild. Uh, so this is known as a dummy, and it's just basically uh, a testing double that you, you just use to basically fill a parameter. There's no behavior you want to control. There's nothing you want to do uh, around them, but just basically fill a parameter. But things get more interesting. And it can happen that you have this function that you know, is checking if, uh, is checking if they, uh, so th th this function is now taking the email sender, so we won't make the main mistake as before. And uh, it's just checking if, this, if the email sender is, is enabled and then just sending the email. So because we, as we said, we have this mock class that helps us create uh, this kind of testing doubles, we can use, the, we, we can use it in, in this way which all it's going to do is create this kind of object, as we saw before, that we can create manually. But in this case, it's just going to create this object where when you call it, it's just going to return success. And when you, when you pull the, the, uh, his attribute is enabled, it's just going to return true. So with this way, we can easily create a mock. And I want to ask, because I want to know if this is too basic, how many people already knew all this? Well, is there anyone here who didn't knew this? OK, so I'll speed up. Don't worry, there is more, there is more advanced contents later in the slides. So, uh, OK, so this is uh, all good. When you're creating mocks, it can also happen when you're using what's known as a stop in the testing terminology. You might not even care what's inside. You just want to fill the parameter, but still the, class is, uh, still the object is being interacted within the function that you're testing. And you can just basically create a mock. And this is something really cool about mocks in Python. Mocks will automatically create child mocks whenever you access a property of them. So what this means is that in this function, uh, you, you call, when you call uh, email sender, which is a mock, and you call dot is enabled, this is going to return a mock. Or when you call the mail sender, it's going to return your mock. Every single time you call any method in a mock, it's just going to return you a child mock. OK. 
So this is all cool, but then it can happen as well that within your function you might be using what's called uh, magic methods. Uh, and in, this, in that situation, if you run this with a mock, as we saw before, this is going to race because the mocks don't have implemented magic methods. So basically, you use a magic mock, which is a mock with magic methods. Uh, uh, the only magic method which is actually implemented in mock is call. Call is implemented both in mock and magic mock. But for the rest, you need to use a magic mock. But let's speed up because we said you all, all of you already know this. Okay. Um, yes. So uh, really quickly, what can you do with mocks when you want to define behavior and you want to like, yeah, you want to instrument it to do more complicated behavior than we saw before? We say that you can use, for example, return value to say what's going to return whenever you call it. You can also use side effect. You can pass a list of values that are going to be returned in order. So here, if you call, for example, email sender four times, it's going to return first two, 10, 20, and zero. If you call it again, it will raise stop iteration. You can use side effect to raise exceptions. And you can also use side effect to call the function. Has anyone uh, seen anyone uh, something that they haven't seen before so far? Raise hands. Okay, it's going up at least. That makes me feel a little bit better. Okay, so uh, but what, what happens if, the, as we saw in the first example, the object that we want to patch, well, sorry, the object that we want to, uh, the, that we want to use at uh, testing double is an internal dependency of the function. Here you can see that the function doesn't take email sender as, a, as an argument, but it's, it instead, either, you know, it can be a class that has it as, as an attribute, or it can be some kind of a global object. So in this situation, we have uh, the, the mock library has uh, a patch uh, function that you can pass a string and it will just replace whatever you, ha you have in there for a magic mock. Uh, this can be used as a decorator or as a context manager or, or manually, and then basically it returns you the magic mock that it, sub it, it substitutes the object with, and then you can control how it's gonna behave. We, if we have time, which I'm sure we will because I'm gonna go fast, uh, we'll see how this actually works, which is quite cool. Um, the patch function has a couple of arguments that allows you to, so as we said, by default, it's gonna create the magic mock. You can change what it creates. You can also change the object that you want to pass in if you want to put your own object, and we'll see some more afterwards. Um, you can also verify the interactions that you have with, the, uh, with your mock. So here we said we, said we, 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 are, passing, uh, we are passing a mock that's gonna interact and provide uh, like internal inputs into the function. And we can also do this, like a third call with, which is, which is gonna check that the mock was called with those arguments. Does it make sense? Has anyone noticed the bug? Because this is gonna fail. So this last function is gonna erase. This, this uh, send email has never been called because we are, we are, what the function is actually calling is send mail. This is a thing, the thing I hate the most about mock. So when we are working with mocks, which are uh, testing doubles that try to verify the interactions, the mock object, well, the mock class in, in, the, in the mock module of the unit test library um, sometimes can play against you. So how do you, how do you solve these kind of situations? So you can use spec. Uh, spec allows you to, to make your testing, well, it allows you to, to make your mock uh, have the same interface as your, as the object that you are that you are mocking. So here, if you pass mailing, which is an uh, which is like an existing class, the mock is going to have the same interface. And if you try to use something that's not part of interface, like send email, because we saw that it, the original one was send mail, this is going to raise an attribute there. When you are using patch, there is a, an argument that you can pass, which is called auto spec. And because you are patching a real object, well, it, it, because you are patching an, uh, an existing object, it will be able to infer as well the interface from here. Okay. Now, this is all cool, but then you have this, right? So you go to the, tra you go to the train and they tell you what spec, yeah, you always have the spec, it's so great, but you know, Python and like typing and how is spec gonna figure out what, it, what the mock is gonna return? Because if you use spec here, for example, uh, on send, uh, um, you're, you're mocking this, when you call send email, what, well, send mail, what that's gonna return is just a mock, a magic mock, and that magic mock doesn't have a spec, right? So how do you fix that? How do you, how do you work with that? And the thing is, because we, have, because we have the test like that, and we're working with a mock, what we're doing is we create the magic mock here, right? We, we then, sorry, this, so this email sender is actually mock. So here we define how we, we define the expectation and the behavior of the mock. 
We are then going to call the method here. But if this, if, if, if this uh, function that we are testing calls anything in the mock that's outside of the specification, it's going to fail. And you can see here there is another problem, which is that we are calling .data here, and we are doing .payload. And again, this assert call is going to fail. But this is going to go through smoothly. And if you're working with a mock that we want to verify how it works, you ideally want it to fail here, right? Because this is not what you defined. So you can see that when you're writing a test and you're using a mock, what you really want is, OK, I declare the mock. I, de I, I declare its behavior. Here is ultra useful, the property of creating child mocks. But here, I don't want child mocks. If I'm working with a mock that I'm going I'm, I'm to verify the, uh, the behavior, I don't want it to create uh, child mocks. If you have worked with gmocks, for example, in C++, they have different type of mocks, so you can handle this. And this is the, this is the good news. From Python 3.7, you have a new function called seal where you can, you can freeze a mock. Who has seen this before? Who has seen seal? Hands up. Great. <laughs> yes. So now you can do seal. And seal is recursively going to freeze your whole mock. OK? This will allow you to effectively now define your mock, seal it, freeze it. That's the behavior it's going to have. And when you pass it to, when you pass it to this function, if there is something that doesn't match, it, it, will, it will like like the real object, well, like, like the object you define. So it's going to raise an exception. Yes. OK. Now, something I find extremely useful is if you have done JavaScript, you know what spies are. Uh, basically, sometimes you have a real object that you want to pass to a function, and you want, but you want to verify the function, how the function interacts with it. So with mock, you can have the wraps keyword. And what this is going to do, this is going to say, like, hey, create the mock, OK? And I want the mock to whatever function that it's being called, just pass it to the real object. But I want you to record all the interactions that it's doing so then I can assert on them. So not only we can, well, like, as all the mocks, we can then verify the interaction with them. We can get the arguments that we're calling. So it's basically recording everything that happened. And you can uh, test, you, you can verify how, uh, how the function that you're testing is uh, interacting with others. This can happen. This is, can be useful, for example, if you have, uh, like, you're calling, if you have some integration test where you're calling outside, you still want it to call outside, or you want to call it to a fake database or something like that, and you don't want to re implement the whole thing, but you just want to be able to record what's going on, this is really handy. Okay, so basically, what I've seen, I haven't flying through the naming, sorry about that, I should have explained you what the names are. This is on the slides online. So uh, there are dummies, fakes, stats, spies, and mocks, uh, which is basically uh, namings for different use cases of the mock. Um, we see that how unit test.mock can help you create them, uh, how patch can be used to testing uh, doubles on internal dependencies, how you can use spec or seal to freeze your, your mock, and uh, how wraps allows you to create spies. Now, if there is something I want you to take away from this talk, um, Oh, I'll, I'll, is there anyone from the organization here? Because they, they are not going to like that. But if, 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 if there is something I want you to try out in this conference, in this trip to Edinburgh, is anyone here from outside Scotland? OK, amazing. So there's something you have to try before you leave your Python. And it's a deep fried Mars bar. OK? <laughs> I'm hooked to them. OK? But anyway, we, we have time for more content. So uh, I'm, I'm going to show as well some other features of the mock libraries. So this is what's called uh, Sentinels. Uh, basically, there are some situations, like the first example we saw, where you might have an argument that you, you, might, you might just have to pass through uh, an internal dependency of the functions, and you want to verify. So you can pass a string. Uh, for example, a lot of money. I have problem coming with strings, because I always wonder, like, hmm, is a function actually returning what I tell him to return, or is, or is internally coded like that? So Mog had what's called a Sentinel. And basically, it allows you to create unit, ob unit objects by just calling the, for example, here, you see unit test.morg import sentinel, and you can do sentinel.budget, and that's always a unique object, so you can assert on it. It's just handy. But uh, I'm sure many people have had problems with patch. Who has, had, who has had problems when patching things and they don't work, right? Great. So these three, three, these three slides ideally will solve all your problems from now on. So how does patch actually work? The thing is, when you try to patch something, what's going to happen is um, uh, the mock model is going to go to, well, you're, you're passing this string, right? That this string is path to set, an attribute to set, and all that mock's going to do is going to do a set out or not. So uh, 
as we saw that the patch has function had has different uh, uh, keyword arguments to do different magic, but here we're just going to focus on the basic one. So this is just going to do a set tatter. And uh, the, the way it works is, so here you have the package module target, and you say, hey, I want to patch package module target, right? So what's going to do? Magic mocks on it, right? That's easy to understand. Now what happens? When you have a real program, and you have this myfile.py, and it's import target, if you tell uh, unit test.mock to, hey, can you please patch package module target, what it's going to do? It's going to go to package module target and put a magic mode there. Is that what you want? Nope. What you want is to patch that one, right? But because what's doing is it's going to the, to the namespace here, going to target and, and just doing a set adder is not what you expect it to do. So what you want it to do is you want to patch target in my file. If you do that, mock is just going to do and put it there, which is what you want. So whenever you are patching anything, remember to patch where you are using. That's usually the, the easiest way to understand that. If you understand that all that patch is doing is literally going to the dictionary of the namespace or whatever you are telling him to go, and then patch that doing a set adder on 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 the target, it will be much much easier to you know mentally understand what's actually going on. Um, also, as a bonus, uh, when you do patch, you can as we say we pass the new, and um, you, if if you're trying to patch something that that still doesn't exist. A patch has a, has a keyword argument called create that instead of doing the set adder will actually put something there so you can do, you can do a patch even if the, if the attribute doesn't exist. But well, the key uh, on, how, on how that patch works and if you have problems with that is always patch wherever you're using it. And then all problems go away. Okay, uh, how are you doing with, okay, great. So next thing, something I loved. Uh, how many people here use PyTest? Great. So if you combine PyTest with mocks, you can do something really cool, which is you can create fixtures that are just mocks. And if you have really big mocks, which can happen and have gone through, you can just create, for example, this is a super simplified version, but you can create this, for example, OS system mock, and you can just depend on them, and you can define the behavior in a single fixture, and this will be quite useful because you don't, you won't have to repeat them. Something that happens, Quite often, when you're patching, if you have multiple marks in, uh, that you're that you're patching in a function and you're passing it as arguments, is remember that because of what patch is going to do is it's going to go, it's going to patch all this thing, and then when you use it as a decorator, it's going to add an argument at the end uh, that's, that that gives you the, the, the mode that you're working on. So if you have two patches, remember that the first patch I should have put a slide about this. The first patch uh, will be the last argument. The second patch will be the second argument. Just think on how it works, which is that it's appending at the end uh, when you declare the decorator. It's a little, bit, a little bit weird at the beginning, but if you see it as it works, which is probably not the best answer, uh, you can understand why it works like that. If you use a lot of mocks, uh, you say, wow, this is amazing, right? I can, I can mock all my stuff. So uh, if you use a lot of mocks, it can happen that when you are debugging, you're seeing your logs and everything, you see things like this, which is rather unuseful. So mock has a, a keyword argument when you create them called uh, name, and you can name your mocks, and whenever you uh, use wrapper or the string, because you are printing them or checking them in, in, in PDB, uh, you can see which mock you were referring. If you then use the child mocks thing where you, know, you are accessing attributes, you will also see the whole name of it, which is quite handy. And uh, we have time for Kahoot. So, uh, as I told you about the Mars bar, I really like Swift. And how, how many people have tried this? This is a UK Swift, which is absolutely amazing. So we are, doing, we are gonna do a quiz, and the person who wins takes this. And it's about mocks. So you can, uh, if you have a phone, you can go to kahoot.it. And let me bring that up. Oh, why do I have this thing? Also, you'll get all the glory of being the person who won. Second internet, come on, you can do it. Okay. So you can put chuk 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 chuk. Has anyone played Kahoot before? Great. So there should be a code somewhere here. So if you go to kahoot.it, you can put that code. Names will start to appear and we'll start with a quiz. Four questions. The fastest and correct one uh, will win the teacups. I love them. I have like five of them at home. 
Okay, let's give 10 seconds. Have five minutes. Okay, plus questions? Okay. Plus questions, great. Okay. Let's go. Ooh, still people joining. 74377, seven. easy to remember. So there we go, uh, full screen. So the first of all is who is the original author of the mock module? Which is, is around the conference, you can back him. <laughs> so Michael Ford, Victor Steiner, Ron Obvious, or the Black Knight? Michael. Don't say it. <laughs> hey, 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 it was not that easy. It gets harder. Uh, there's a stop. Which of the following allows us to create the spy? So, yeah. Which of those ones, or we cannot create spies in, in Python? I should put some music. Cool. That was easy, so you were actually paying attention. Wow. <laughs> I should take my family this. Okay, which of the following lines will, will, will raise? You'll have, you have some more time here. So you can choose, so this is the code, and it's either A, B, or none of them. So we, we, we're using seal here. You remember, CEO will recursively uh, freeze all your mocks. And here we see that we have mock, callable one, um, bum. So uh, it was the blue one. Why was that? So there's something I didn't tell you, so you failed this question specifically, uh, which is that when you seal a mock, it will only it will see recursively as far as the mock is a child mock of the mock you are sealing. So what that means is that here, when you do mock.callable, this mock that is being automatically created is marked as a child of the first one, but as a way to be able to um, disable this recursiveness on the, on the seal, if you pass your own mock, it won't seal it. So it's basically going through the child rather than checking all the mocks inside. <laughs> that was tricky, right? And the last one, another, I, I like exceptions. So there you go. So you have mock.called. This is a normal mock, not seal or anything. Mock.called, mock.assert fake called, mock.assert underscore called. Which one will fail? Is, there, is any of them going to raise an exception? This one was, whoa, are you serious? This, one's, this one was really hard. OK, wow. I'm, I'm impressed. You should come and give the talk instead of me. So for those of you that either hit all of them by, mis like by mistake or like, hey, let's try it out. Um, so cold is raising an exception because cold is actually an, an attribute of mock, and it just returns a number. And when you, when you, if you try to call a number, it's going to raise an exception. Now, a certified call, if I were you, I would have expected that to create a child mock. But it doesn't because there is a check in the mock library that if the name starts by assert underscore, well, by assert, it's going to raise. Because there were so many mistakes about people like mistyping something. And then, you know, you are in this situation where, like, is the test passing because the assert actually worked? Or is the test passing because the assert is creating a child mock? So there were so many types of typos with that that, you know, there's now a check that if it's assert, um, it will race if it start with a cert. And the third one, which I'm impressed you knew about it, there is also a check in case you mistype a cert <laughs> and you do a threat. Wow, you're amazing. Okay, so Philly, who's Philly? Oh no, are you serious? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Please, a hand for Philly. <laughs> OK. So with that, uh, I'll upload the slides. You have a bunch of links here. Um, the, the, mock it's, the mock module itself is kind of easy to read if you, uh, if you dare. Um, and then some other slides about testing in general. And uh, a, a cool talk if you want to know more about the patch function and, well, the module itself. And uh, now should be time for questions. OK. So when any one of you has questions, you can just come in front to the mic. 
These are questions for Mario or for me, the graceful winner. Yeah. So. <laughs> you should take them all. So, any questions for Mario? Any question for him? <laughs> okay, so if there are no questions, then let's give a thank you for Mario for his. Thank you.